Okay, so we'll start uh, with another talk. Uh, our next speaker uh, is Martina Szturdikowa. And Martina is a senior software engineer with an outstanding plus 10 year track record in delivering enterprise level software. Uh, last year she worked in uh, JP Morgan. And she's very active in promoting technology to girls and women in Slovakia, where she acts as an advisor for a nonprofit organization. So let's warmly wel welcome Martina. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you. And what an amazing, amazing conference. You know, the first conference here, great organization. It went really smoothly. I know they, they were telling me that, oh, yeah, we have a little bit bugs here and there, but. I guess from us attendees and from the uh, speakers, it was really, really well organized. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me over here. I'm really glad and happy to be here. Now, I hope you're all, you had your co afternoon coffee and you're not going to get into your food coma after the sandwich lunch. Hopefully all good and you won't fall asleep. Good. So uh, who am I? Uh, my name is Martina Shurikova and um, I'm a vice president or a Python application developer at the investment bank at JP Morgan Chase uh, in New York City. Anybody who doesn't know who JP Morgan Chase is? Good. Okay, so if you don't know who that is, it is an international organization with um, it is really an industry leader in most of the markets that we operate in. And uh, we uh, work with customers that can be governments, corporations, or even individuals in over 100 countries. We have about um, 240,000 employees worldwide. And out of that, we have 40,000 employees just in technology alone. Uh, we have a budget of about $9 billion to spend on technology per year. So uh, you have my contact information over here as well. Uh, feel free to uh, email me to link me in. If you do link me in, please let me know that it's from PyCon, otherwise I'll ignore you. Our, uh, uh, <laughs> and yeah, let me know also the feedback. I definitely want to know um, how you enjoyed the uh, presentation and if there's anything that can be um, improved. Why am I here? A couple of different reasons. One, I'm uh, from Slovakia. I definitely like to contribute to the Slovak community. And uh, second, um, I, I'm also on the board of ITVIT, so I like to, to promote that as well. And the thirdly is the topic that I'm doing today. It's the name was what you didn't know, you didn't know. Might be a little confusing for some, but you know, I started working at JP Morgan Chase about four years ago with very limited knowledge of finance, well, definitely no knowledge of finance for investment bank, and very limited experience to zero experience in Python. But I had several years of programming experience already. I was a C, mainly C Sharp developer before, uh, as well as a little bit of C++, maybe PHP, and so forth. So I, I told myself, hey, not a big deal. I'm a computer scientist. I know how to program. I understand the object-oriented concepts. I understand programming concepts, design patterns, and so, so forth. I'll be great, right? It will just, I'll just start coding in Python. Well, I soon learned that Python, although it is a prog object-oriented programming language, it has its own ways of doing things, the Pythonic ways. And I want to talk to you today about, really, the objective of this talk is to inspire you, to um, encourage you to be more curious about the language. A lot of times when I ask somebody, well, how comfortable are you with Python? And they tell me, you know, four out of one to five, five being the best, or eight out of one to 10, eight, 10 being the best. And they tell me, you know, four or eight. And then they don't really understand, let's say generator expressions, decorators, or some of the Pythonic ways of doing things. But they know what they know, so they are using the language in the way they know it, and they still can, uh, provide pretty good solution, right? But you can be even more efficient developer with, uh, with code that is more readable, uh, that is reusable. Python has lots of built-in functions that a lot of people don't know. And uh, yeah, you can provide solutions uh, that can be faster than, let's say, in the plain old way of doing things. 
So that's why I'm here. The objective is to inspire you. We don't have enough time to go into details into an inter intermediate level of decorators or you know, any other topic. So I'll just go high level and then I will ask you to go and research it at home on your own. Take it as tools that you will use for your own development in the future, right now, and so forth. Explore it. Now, I have a pic this picture. Uh, I was supposed to give this talk with my coworker, Laura, a picture there. Uh, she's right here. Laura wasn't able to make it, so I just want to give her a big shout out and uh, make sure that she has a speedy recovery. She, uh, she wasn't able to come, but uh, you know, this is a picture uh, from her Girls Who Code Club, where she teaches. Uh, high school students and girls how to how to um, how to code and they went on a field trip to Google in New York so Laura uh, get well soon and I wouldn't be a good board member if I wouldn't ask you to support ITVIT is an amazing organization that uh, promotes uh, technology to young women uh, to our girls in high schools and please go to our, to our Facebook page, like, like us. I checked how many likes we have right now, so I'll know how many people, how many of you will actually like us. And your technologists, come and talk to our high schools. Uh, inspire uh, our children to study computer science, to study computing, please. So let's, let's get to it. So here are a few helpful features that I believe every Python programmer should know. And Mind you, there's plenty of them, uh, but these are kind of high level that I was surprised to find out that a lot of people don't actually know them. So let's just go over some of them. So help. Is anybody who has never used help within an interactive console? Okay, so you did, so you know it. So you know that you can actually go to, uh, let's use this one to a console, type help, and then get uh, various helps on various topic. Use an interactive help, right? I can say, let's say, uh, keywords. I'm a little bit nervous, so I can't type. Uh, Non-local, right? And I can learn about it. Let's say uh, uh, you're coding um, in an airplane or you don't have internet access, so you cannot go to the uh, uh, Python documentation, well, you can go over here into, right into your interactive uh, console and do it yourself there. Or you can also, let's say, learn about some other topics. Let's say, what is the zip callable? What does it mean? And you can get doc string of the, uh, of the callable as well as the attributes that is list. Next, I pointed out over here, dear, again, I'm surprised when people told me that they didn't know about it. Uh, you need to, it's like an IntelliSense that you might not have in your editor, but you need to really quickly find out you don't remember necessarily the name of a function or an attribute or, or you know, anything else that the module might have. Use dear. It has two ways that you can use it. One, without, I mean, I just printed over here. So one is uh, without any arguments in it, what it will do is it will print out everything that is in your current uh, scope, or you can pass in something. So for example, over here, I pass, I wanna find out what is in func tools. And it prints out everything that's inside that, and now I can actually use it or find help on it and figure out how to use it. Let's go next. Every is there somebody who doesn't know what enumerate is? What it does? You guys are good. Okay, we do have people, cool. So there is a lot of people I've seen code that, you know, you want to iterate, iterate uh, over a specific iterable object, right? And uh, you, a lot of people are coming from different languages, will try to get the indices and then get the value or an element from the iterable through that index. But in Python, you can use the uh, enumerate uh, callable that will give you an index as well as a value. So you don't have to then uh, go and try to fetch the, that value, that element out of that list. And what's good over here, if you look at my examples, the first one was actually a list because 
in order to get uh, an index out of an iterable, it has to, you have to get it from somewhere. You cannot get it from an iterator uh, necessarily. So over here, I actually use a uh, generator expression. And then through that, I just get the index as well as uh, the value right, uh, right here. Now, my, the examples, you know, definitely not up to code standard or anything like that. So it's just to uh, prove the point to kind of show you a really um, concise an ex example for what we are talking. Zip. Zip is something that you can use if you have multiple iterables and you want to combine them together or you want to separate them. Right, so over here right now, I'm showing you a uh, list of tuples, which is the postcode as well as the city. And I want to separate this tuple into two lists, zip codes and cities. I can do it with the zip callable with uh, the asterisk inside it. So this one will take a list with tuples and break it down into list of postal codes and list of cities. Right, so now I printed them, and you have them right here. However, you can do it the other way around. Let's say you have two lists right now. You can use a callable zip and pass in the two iterables, and you actually combine them together. So you get a tuple right here that then you can use in whatever way you want. I put over here an example of a dictionary comprehension where I built a dictionary uh, depending with the city being the key and the postal code being the, uh, the value. Now, don't stop over here. Uh, there is a also module called the ITOTools, ITOTools, I always make that mistake, ITOTools. Uh, go there, explore it. It has really cool, cool callables functions that you can actually use. I mean, we can have a look at it right here. Right, so if we want to, if anybody, I don't know if anybody knows, you can also do a pprint. <coughs> and you can print uh, basically all the modules. So you see that it has plenty of various uh, tools that you can use over various iterables. And one, we had the zip function. The zip functions will take the shortest uh, iterable in the, uh, uh, in the ar argument list and will stop there. However, we do have a zip longest, which uh, might mean the opposite. So I'll ask you to go and explore it on your own. There has been also a lot of questions about when should I use STR and when should I, when should I use uh, Riper? Does anybody have the answer over here? Why would you use Riper? Exactly, that's right. And there is an example over here where if we have the H1 and then H string, which is an, a string, if we print it as a string, you don't see the difference. But if you print it as Riper, as representation of the object, you actually see that one of them is a string. So the wrapper should be used by coders uh, within the debug statements, you know, anytime for, to help you debug the applications better. People are asking to increase the font size. Oh, let's try to do it this way. Is it doing anything? It's not, right? You think we'll be able to? I, don't, I thought that it would work. I'm not sure. So you in the bag, you don't see it, right? Hmm. Anybody knows in Jupyter how we could do that? Because this is not working. That should be the same thing, yeah. Maybe we can do that. Yeah, I'm getting your LinkedIn request right now. So. <laughs> uh. Okay, hold on. That's 
the Windows 10 and to get to it. Oh, you know what I can do also? I actually have the, uh, the talk here. Maybe I can increase this. So we won't do it as slides, we'll do it as a notebook. Is this better? Yeah? Yes or no? No? Okay, it doesn't go anymore. Better? Okay, cool. So let's see what we can do with this. Okay, I'll try to now, you will see everything, not the way how the slides work, but that's okay. So, MRO, method resolution order. Uh, Python supports multiple uh, inheritance. And sometimes it can get very confusing, so it's really good to know how to find out what the method resolution order is for a specific object or a type. And there is actually a function that you call on an object called the MRO, and you'll get kind of the sequence, um, the order of uh, the way the methods are going to be uh, resolved. So I'm not going to, this is, this is a topic that should be covered on its own. I'm not going to dive into it, but it's really good to know. Like for example, over here, mm -hmm. we slide it all the way back. This is going to be harder. Okay, so over here, you know, I have, we have a class D that inherits from B and C. Now I put into the comments, you should try to avoid having multiple concrete classes, uh, inheriting from multiple concrete classes. And if you do need to, just use mixins, use one and use mixins uh, instead. But let's say we have this scenario, so we are inheriting from B and C, and B, both B and C are inheriting from A. So we really have a diamond uh, inheritance in, in this case. Um, so what I'm showing you over here, you know, with the string, you can actually see how it's, how it's going within the uh, Dunder SDR, Dunder method, the magic method, how the, uh, the order is actually resolved, but you can also get it this way, uh, object or class.mro. Oh, this is, I just put it over here. Anybody who doesn't know Python Tutor? Well, now you do. Awesome, it's an amazing, amazing site where uh, if you wanna see how uh, things are working within Python, I mostly use it for memory management to see how memory is allocated within a stack, within a heap, but uh, you can also go uh, through the code itself, so I'll just quickly show you. You can just go, see how it's being defined and how, how it's being allocated, and you can go step by step. So let's say you don't have uh, access to a debugger or anything like that, you, can, you want to really quickly see how things are working, or uh, you want to explain to somebody uh, how your object is working uh, within a specific space, so you can do it over here. And it's great, you can also share that on, uh, on your website or sh share a link with this exact, exact code and uh, use it with somebody else. They also have a shared session if you want. Let's go to functions. Now, I'm mostly talking today um, about Python 3. Um, if, if anybody has any questions on how to do it in Python 2, or whether there is a way, try to ask me. I might know, I might not. Well, try to figure it out. Uh, so in Python 3, what you can do, if you are a uh, framework developer, an API developer, and you wanna make sure uh, that your developers or your users of your code, your API, are using named or keyword arguments, you can actually enforce it in Python 3 by adding the star over here before the, uh, the argument list. What that means is, if I call func my function with positional arguments, just one and two, you'll get an exception. And it will tell you it takes zero positional arguments, you have to pass them as keyword arguments right here. So a little bit something interesting in Python 3. Now, in the description of this talk, there was also, I also called it Python pitfalls. However, it's not really Python pitfalls. I would say it's mostly programmer pitfalls sometimes because uh, 
if you know object-oriented programming, you understand Python, you know that in Python almost everything is shared by reference. So uh, just be aware of mutable default arguments. In, uh, in Python, whenever there is a function, and we have a function at attendee uh, with a default argument roster assigned to an empty list. This empty list is going to be created during an import time when this function is being, uh, is being uh, declared. So what that means is every time I will use this function with no default argument, I won't pass in um, rosters, so it's going to be using the default. It's going to be using the same instance of the list. As demonstrated over here, I have the day one attendee at Martina and day two attendee at Lucia. Now it's printing the same thing because it's actually using the same instance of the list. However, if there is actually more than just this issue, there is also the issue that, again, it's passed by reference. Um, I'm pretty sure that the caller doesn't mean that I will modify their list. What if their list is you know, a list of initial attendees, right? We don't want to add things to it. Maybe they want to keep it that way. So that's another problem over here. So how would we solve this? Let's see, I have to do it this way. First of all, assign roster to none. This way you know that if no roster is being passed in, you just create an empty list. And then copy uh, the list if it, was, if it was passed in, copy the list into your new label called the same roster, but you know that you have a different instance of an object and you're not necessarily, you're not modifying the, uh, the list that is being passed in. And just to demonstrate that, we are again creating, adding attendee Martina and then Lucia to, through two different functions, and it correctly uh, returns uh, the correct list. And then also one of the, the third one, day three, we reuse for day four, and we see that you know, we are not modifying the day three attendees list. Now in Python, uh, functions are first class objects, higher level functions. And this is something that is not necessarily used in other languages or the concept is not as known. Uh, I mean, it, it is an object-oriented programming language, but it has some functional programming uh, features in it as well. So what this means is that we can actually take a function and pass it around, return it, we can inspect it, and maybe even change it at runtime. I actually once uh, saw a talk where a, uh, the speaker was changing the opcode through the decorator of the function so that it would be, it would be faster with whatever Python code it could be. Uh, it was an you know, interesting example of how powerful this feature can be. And you can also assign it to a different variable. Now, let's say you can freeze the function and then assign it and then reuse that variable as if it was the function. So I thought that if we dive in into a specific topic, and uh, I'm afraid I won't have time to go into other topics that I wanted to discuss today, but uh, closures and decorators. A lot of times I ask people if they know what a decorator is. And unfortunately, I get a lot of times that they know that it's the add property class method or something like that, but I have no idea how they would create it and why they would create it themselves. Again, if you're a framework developer, an API developer, or you know, you're doing a, uh, a system uh, integration and so forth, you might use decorators for, uh, for various things. There are great to, um, to solve some design patterns problems uh, so that you can, for example, create a factory class uh, with a decorator. So you don't have to uh, manually add something into a factory. You can just register it uh, through, through a decorator, for example, plugin architecture and so forth. So let's look at closures. Decorators are closures. So this is why I wanted to, uh, to discuss this in a little bit more details. Tomorrow we are actually having a Django Girls Day and we are going to be covering Django. Django is look, uh, using a lot of decorators. So again, an interesting topic to know what it is about and how to use them, how to create them yourself for yourself. 
So uh, a decorator is a closure. What that means, it is a function within a function. It's a nested function. Now, I have lots of cons concepts in this one function. So let me, I'll break it down. We'll go to, uh, to my interpreter. We'll just play around with it a little bit. But uh, basically, this is, we defined it as a decorator so we can decorate any functions that we have, right? Now, what it is, it's really a wrapper around another function. So the add function now becomes really our inner function over here within the decorator and is replaced by it. And then within the inner function, we can do whatever we want with it. We can, not as we are doing in, in this example, print the uh, argument list, the values that are passed in, and also print the uh, return value. Now, this example also co counts how many times this function was called. So a little different concept. So let's go first through just the decorator, and we'll go over the uh, the reps, uh, edge reps. Anybody use edge reps and know what that is? Awesome, cool. So let's look at an, first let's, let's look what this actually prints. So we decorate, add, and subtract. So we call it over here. Now you see that it prints initialize decorator over here, and that is because the decorate is called during the import time. And the inner function then is called during the call time. So here, you know, we're just defining, we're basically importing add and subtract, so the create is being called. Now we are calling add and subtract, and you can see that it actually goes inside the decorator function, uh, prints the list, and also counts how many times it's being called. So we called it twice, one, two, add, re, subtract, again, one and two. So it's a very powerful feature that you can use. Uh, as I mentioned, non-locals and wraps. So let's have a look at that. I actually have a different list right here. So first, let's see what this means if I don't have wraps. Um, the uh, decorator function wraps that it's coming from the func tools. What it means is, let's say I print the function add name and as well as the doc string of the function. However, what you, what you get is the wrapped function, the, uh, uh, the inner func, and no docs, right? But that's not true. I, in my ed, I actually have, it's called ed, and it has a doc string at two numbers, same as a plus b. So what the wraps does, if I change that, it actually will give you the correct name, the correct doc string, the correct uh, uh, information, so that if somebody uh, is using if you're, if you're using this as a, um, you know, for an API framework, again, very useful to your end users, your developers that are using your framework. Now, let's have a look at the uh, non-locals. So, uh, let's say, let me, let me just take one of these one and let me modify that and let's reuse it. So, I, ha I, had, I, had over, I add over here the counter, right? And I initialize it to zero because this is going to be initialized during the import time. And then whenever the inner function is called, I want to uh, increase it. So let's say over here, I'll put counter plus equals one, and let's say I want to print it. Now, what do you think will happen right now? Well, let's have a look. Hold on, this one. And we need to call it. Oh, we need to call it, so we need to actually call it. We got an unbound exception counter. It doesn't recognize counter because we actually defined it in uh, the parent function and uh, we are tr right now trying to override it within the uh, child function. So what we need to do is, uh, by, by the way, if I just do this, right, it's going to be fine. I'm not going to get the correct counter because I'm not increasing the counter, but I can actually get the value. But if you're trying to override the value, 
uh, you're going to get the unbound, the, uh, the exception. So uh, let me right now do the unlocal counter. And now I can do counter plus equals one. And we actually get a counter, right? If I call it again, hopefully you can get it twice, right? So that's an example of the wraps and the non-local. Again, very quickly, very high level, you can actually have uh, decorators with parameters. So go, go ahead and explore it. I mean, Django, that's what's using uh, uh, argument list within the decorator function itself. So definitely something to, to look through, to, logo, to look over. Now, Let's go, now we talked about the non-locals really quickly, uh, just because we talked about that, globals. If, if you guys didn't know, you can actually do the same thing with a global variable and actually overwrite that if you define, uh, if you use global, let's say I have a global x, and then if I use global x, then I can actually change the x to the value that I want it to change, and if I print it, it will actually modify it. If I do it again without it, well, then I don't want to modify this one. If I remove the X, hold on. I get an uh, exception because it's wrong. Let's see? Okay, the same exception. I need to use global. So, how are we doing on time? Time for Q&A, so thank you so much. Um, I did have, I wanted to talk a little bit about generator expressions and so forth, so if anybody, if you're interested, come uh, talk to me afterwards. You know, there is uh, definitely an interesting concept there. Again, mutable stuff with, uh, uh, with lists, so feel free to find me and talk to me. Thank you. So the first question, why Windows and CMD? Oh, because I'm a Windows user. I use Windows at work, and why not to use it at home? We have Mac at home as well as Windows, so I guess just a Windows user, and I've always been. I was a C-sharp developer before. I've been a Visual Studio user for ages, so just my preference. Okay, uh, next one. Coming from C++, C-sharp, what are your thoughts on programming in dy dynamically typed language like Python? Oh my gosh, at the beginning I was like, hell, uh, this is messy, uh, this is just horrible. I was, I, I, had, I didn't have nice thoughts about it, uh, but that changed because I learned how to use the power of the language in order to deliver the best solution for my users. Okay, next one. What is the most memorable example of missing Python knowledge that you have encountered in a developer? How did they work around it? Uh, well, many times, I mean, even with the uh, generator uh, functions, I've been, it's, it's not that it's a missing Python knowledge, but again, I didn't know what I didn't know. So I didn't know that I can use generator functions in order to dynamically generate uh, the values of, uh, you know, of an iterable of, of, of anything that I need to go through. So I would do the various complex design patterns into, in order to solve that, and that wasn't the most efficient way. So uh, the biggest lesson was every time I see code uh, that somebody written and I don't understand it, go and understand it, figure it out, what it's doing, why it's there, right? Be curious about it. And that, that is my biggest lesson to myself to really just, just don't say, okay, I don't understand that. Like so many times I avoided slots. I'm like, okay, it's there, I see it, but I'm like, I have no idea what they do. Finally, I'm like, okay, let me read it. I'm like, oh, damn. Yeah, it's like, it's pretty straightforward, but people have to actually go into it and understand it. Okay, uh, why those spaces inside function call statements? Hmm? Spaces. Uh, you mean when I was saying callables, or I'm not sure what people mean? Hmm? Uh, 
Ah, that's just uh, the way I'm used to it, I guess. And some styling things that I might use somewhere, I don't know. <laughs> okay, uh, so the next question, I think you answered it. Where are you from? How long have you lived in the US? Sure, so I'm from Slovakia. Uh, I'm from Trnava, Trnavi som. Uh, I lived over here. <laughs> I lived over here, uh, well, this will age me, but okay. Uh, for 20 years, and I lived in America for 15 years. So I, uh, I work and live in Manhattan and uh, for JP Morgan Chase, but I love coming back and I love give back to the community. So again, I'll shout out, you know, ITYT, please support us. Please, uh, you know, help get more diverse workplace for, workplace for ourselves. We are going to be uh, building better companies, better teams, better, better community. Okay, uh, last two questions. Uh, for offline docs, I use Dash or Zeal. What do you think about these tools compared to help function? I don't know. We have internal frameworks, so uh, I didn't use any of those, so I don't know. Okay. And the last one, why you use mouse so much? Isn't it slower? <laughs> well, if I would have my actual mouse, I would actually use mouse, but uh, I'm not used to this touch thing yet, so I need, I'm trying to get used to it. Okay, so that's all the questions. Thank you for the talk. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you very much.